Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. I'm your host, Heather McFadden, and this is the place where I get to walk alongside you and connect you with people and resources so you know that you don't mom alone. And today, episode 370, I am welcoming to the show Preston Sprinkle. Christians, it's through the 80s, the AIDS epidemic, where we are celebrating God's punishment judgment towards gay people and we were voting for people that were not helping gay people and and so you have a lot like i have friends who who grew up in that era and they're they sat there holding their best friend while he died in the hospital of aids while christians were ranting and raving and that's part of a narrative that that has really angered a lot of lgbt people and i I really want to go out of my way to say that's not me I, i would not be celebrating the death of your friend. Given the statistics of how many Gen Z teens, young adults are identifying as LGBTQ and the number of DMs and questions I've received on this topic, I knew that I needed to do an episode on gender and sexuality, but I've been waiting for the right guest, someone who would not shame my listeners, parents who are one of those one in four families who are walking through this, or not even their own children, perhaps a sibling they have, a parent, um, a close friend who identifies as LGBTQ. How do we navigate grace and truth when it comes to issues of gender and sexuality in our culture? Dr. Preston Sprinkle is the co-founder and president of the Center for Gender, Faith, and Sexuality. And I felt like given his books on the topics, that he would be a great guest. He also has a podcast called Theology in the Raw. He tackles cultural issues. He has done the work to um, continue to lean in and listen with curiosity and compassion. And so he is going to be our guide today. I also noticed that his center has released a course for those parenting LGBTQ kids. And we have that link in the show notes. You can check that out there. And so here we go. Let's hold hands together. We're going to walk into this conversation with Grace, and you'll even hear how I ask Preston to correct me when I'm phrasing things that are not as kind as they could be. And so I hope you will learn alongside us. And so let's get right to it. Here we go. Hey, Preston, welcome to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited about this. Okay. A lot of my listeners are like, I'm anxiously awaiting to listen, but a little nervous. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you're not the only one, sis. I have yeah. played in my head 20 different versions of how I would start this conversation with you. <laughs> because <laughs> I think you and I both hold this. We know what we believe, but this is complicated. And we're not going to say we're experts. Yeah. Right? No, not at all. Um I mean, just parenting alone <laughs> is crazy, and um, <laughs> let alone in 2022 with the questions around sexuality and gender, that it's a topic that is moving at such a fast pace. And the church, even when it wasn't moving at a fast pace, the church typically, typically, not not always, but typically, didn't go about the conversation well, if it was even having it. So, yeah, yeah there's a lot of challenges uh, facing us, which is why we need to dive in. <laughs> And it doesn't just apply to when we're talking about gay, lesbian, transgender, the latest news this week on sexual abuse in the church. It's like we're just not handling the topics of gender and sexuality well. So uh, one thing I want to kind of align on is that's tricky. Are these words affirming and not affirming? And I don't know if that's even a bad place to start, but it feels very divisive that kind of like liberal conservative, all these lines, how do we even handle that conversation? Just the language piece you're yeah, talking about. How yeah. do you even, yeah, the, the, there's, there is no perfect way to categorize things. I used to use affirming, non-affirming meaning, you know, affirming is you affirm same sex marriage. Um, and you believe, you know, the Bible doesn't condemn, um, or prohibit a consensual, monogamous, same-sex um, marital relationship. I, I actually, I used non-affirming before to say, well, I, you know, I don't agree with that or whatever, but um, there's so many things I affirm about gay and lesbian and trans people. So the phrase non-affirming is so intrinsically 
and seemingly exclusively negative. And so I really want to keep the focus on, you know, here's how we disagree over how we define what marriage is, what marriage is for. We have a disagreement over certain aspects of sexual ethics. So there is no real great term. And also another, just the, we can just start off with a bang here, (laughs) showing how language can be tricky. Like the whole phrase LGBTQ affirming doesn't really make any sense because there's a huge difference between trans and like LGB and T. Yeah. Like even, even with affirming, non affirming, we know what that means when it comes to sexuality, like, okay, same sex marriage, but what does it mean to be trans affirming? Why affirm trans people? Well, ob- yes, you affirm the humanity of everybody, but some trans people are gay, some are straight, some are asexual, some are bisexual. Like being trans says nothing about your sexuality. So LGBTQ affirming is doesn't even make sense because we're talking about a wide diversity of different questions there. So yeah. anyway, let's be, well, I'll, well, we need to be gracious. So with language, we're all trying to figure this out. So I think that's what I feel like. Yeah. Like that's where I yeah. feel a lot of parents don't know. They don't know what to say. I don't know about you personally. I have friends and this is personal and it hasn't yeah. hit in my inner inner circle, but it's like one person removed. And so I'm sensitive to those struggling with gender and sexuality issues because yeah. this is personal. And so I want to be careful and how I, how I phrase things. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think even acknowledging, like e- even in this conversation, if you're like, Hey, is this the right word or what's the way best way to say this? And, and I could help with some of that. I'm mediating the perspective of many gay and lesbian friends that I have and trans friends that have helped me. You say, well, th- this term feels a little stigmatizing. I like this term better. And uh, again, there's going to be differences of opinion, even within the LGBTQ population on, on what language is best to use and what isn't, you know, so. Well, I think it's really important that you just said your friends who yeah. are gay, lesbian, transgender, like yeah. these are people, it's not an issue. Right. Um, I think someone wrote a book about that. <laughs> And they're people is not an issue. And so let's you let's know people and let's love people. And so one question someone asked was, is the percentage higher of people who identify in the LBGTQ mm-hmm. demographic or are more people um, just open to sharing their struggles? That's uh, a debated. Well, everything's going to be debated in this, conversation. <laughs> in this whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, as we speak, somebody just sent me a link to the recent episode of Bill Maher. Yes, I watched it last night. Did you? Yeah. Um, so I've been. I was literally about to watch it before. Oh, you, we should have <laughs> watched it together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me give you a few a few percentages. Um, um, the latest Gallup poll. Uh, said that twenty point eight percent of Gen Z identifies as LGBTQ. That's up about two or three percentages from the same poll taken last year. And that is very, very, a lot higher uh, um, than any other kind of adult, more adult population. Gen Z is, you know, about 22 and younger ish. So the, the, there's a massive rise in LGBT people identifying as LGBTQ among younger populations, especially what I call, you know, in between, well, more in between identities, bisexual. It'd be, it'd be much more rare for somebody to identify as, well, especially lesbian, but even gay than bisexual among younger people. Or more, it'd be more common to identify as non-binary than, say, trans. Again, not that people, younger people, don't identify as trans, but these, these so terms, younger people, they're choosing. They're choosing. Like, I don't even want your categories. I don't. Yes. Yes. I don't want to be pinned down. Um, I'm not either this nor that. Some days I feel this, some days I feel that. And part of that is just being a teenager too. I mean, goodness. um, You have a couple. (laughs) And I was one once uh a long time ago. And um, it's a time where things are shifting and changing or exploring and trying to figure out who you are. So anyway, go, so go back to the statistics. Yes. There's a, there is a very a high increase among people publicly identifying as LGBTQ plus. Um, the question is, is that because now, like, were were there always that many that were just scared to come out? Or is there something in society that's encouraging them to identify as something other than straight or 
non-trans? And the answer is yes and yes. I mean, certainly in many parts of culture, it is easier to come out. In fact, in some parts of culture, it's better to not be straight. And, and this is, I've talked to a lot of younger people where in certain, especially more progressive environments, being a, a white, straight, quote unquote, cisgender person, you know, not trans is seen as just kind of like, well, you're, you embody oppression on so many levels, you know? And so the system we're um, pushing against you are, yes. You, and, and you said the word cisgender, which for those who haven't done any research, that would be someone who, who is choosing the gender they were born with. Is that Yes. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't word it quite like okay. that, <laughs> no, but no, okay, let's see that. I <laughs> really want you to correct that, me. But, yeah. I forgot to tell you <laughs> if I say anything, please correct me because it helps the mom because I will tell y'all, I don't know. I don't know how to say these things. And I knew I've had way more conversations on this topic. Yeah. So please correct totally me. Okay. Fine, totally fine. Yeah, please tell um, me, how would you say it? How would you define cisgender? Just basically, you're not trans. Um, okay. And even trans can mean 11 different things to 10 different people. And I'm not even like, that's not, I'm not trying to be like, you know, over the top. Um, so yeah, cisgender just means you're fine with your body, you accept your body. You don't struggle with any kind of like gender dysphoria. You're not distressed over your biological sex. You feel at home in your biological sex. Okay. Um, I don't love, I actually don't prefer the term cisgender. Um, like I don't, typically use it for myself. If somebody refers to me that way, I'm like, ah, whatever your language reflects your ideology. Um, I don't think the term is particularly helpful, but, um, yeah, I'm getting off, off track a little bit, I guess, but uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, so I do think that yes, people are more free to come out now. So, so the percentages probably were higher in the past, but people just didn't publicly identify and now mm -hmm. they're more open. But I also do think, and studies have really shown this that yes we are social creatures and our social environment does have an effect on how we identify and how we view ourselves um, i don't want to pinpoint every single person and say well you're doing that because of culture and you know no you're but you over there you you really would have been gay 20 years ago and now it's you know it's more accepting for you to come out so it's it's hard to kind of separate what is culture what is you know kind of genuinely there. Well, Ben Bill Maher in that video, and we will put it in the show notes so y'all can watch it. Um, who tends to lean maybe more he's left. definitely liberal. Yeah. yeah. Classic, okay. kind of a classic liberal. Kind of the classic. Yeah. So he had this phrase, he said, there is a difference across the country on these numbers. And so either kids in Ohio are being shamed or kids in, it's either being shamed out of kids in Ohio or created in kids in California. Like the discrepancy yeah. is so broad. And so it's probably like you said, both a little bit of shame, a little bit of creating. Yes. Okay, moms, I know that it's that time of year where you're wanting to refresh your wardrobe, but it can be time consuming and a bit stressful. Well, one thing that could help you out is Stitch Fix. Let me tell you more about it. What's great is you go on there, you take a quiz, you set up your style profile, you answer questions about what you like to wear, what you don't, your sizes, your budget, and they will send you five pieces to try on at home. You keep what you love, you send back what you don't. And they even have a shop, so you can go and everything that you like is in like a little store. There's no subscription required. You try it once, you set up automatic deliveries, there's no hidden fees. You can even try it for your husband, for your kids. Sign up today at stitchfix.com slash DMA. You're going to get $20 off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash DMA to get $20 off your first purchase. It's a limited time offer. Purchase within two days of sign up. Stitchfix.com slash DMA. Let's target the topic of I'm teaching my kids how to live in a world that has this gender. Do you even say gender confusion? Is that a, okay? Then? Um, I, that wouldn't feels, say, I would say that feels unkind. Yeah. Yeah. Gender confusion isn't the best term. I'm not completely, I think for some people, yes, they have, and they would even say I'm confused over okay. gender, um, wrestling with their gender identity, struggling. Is that even, yeah. Or even, yeah. Okay. Struggling might be okay. Wrestling with your gender identity. Um, okay. 
I, I would prefer rest, wrestling with your gender identity might be the best kind of okay. neutral phrase, you know? So wrestling with gender identity and sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. But what we're seeing in friends in school districts, this isn't like they haven't even gotten to the point of puberty. And we're talking right. about wrestling with gender before puberty is even hit. So kids are going to school and they're, they're learning about this outside of your parents. So they're asking, how do I talk to my kids? When do I talk to my kids about, you know, maybe you've been listening to the show a long time and I've connected you with birds and bees. And you know that this is a series of conversations. We don't just have one talk about sex. This is like from when they ask, how's that baby going to get out of her tummy? You are talking about sex and how God, you know, made us and how this all happens. But then we talk about when they have these differences. When does that happen? How do we talk about that? Yeah. So, I mean, there's no, I think there's no one size fits all, but I think absolutely we need to start talking at a much earlier age than that probably you and I, our parents did, you know, they it was like, like you're 13, you already know everything. And they're like, let's talk. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to do that right now. For those, no. for those of us who grew up without the internet. Okay. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you can maybe wait until even 13 is like, yeah, you probably should have this conversation at 11. But I always tell people pick what they say, when do I start talking to my kids? I say, okay, pick a number in your head, pick an age in your head and subtract five. <laughs> like, well, and, the, and this, this guest I have on, you might want to talk to them, Mary Flo and um, Megan, they'd say you go to kindergarten, you're in class with whatever child in there has the oldest sibling hmm. because you're the age of your oldest child. Your, your family yeah. is the age of your oldest child. So if they have a teenage sibling, that child is so your child sitting next to a teenager. You can't wait right. until you're yeah. ready and you think your child's innocence is right. whatever. You don't want to steal it. Ought, it should go without, go without saying that like, you know, age appropriate, there's age appropriate ways of talking about it. And I always tell people begin. I think the first kind of conversation, it's extremely age appropriate is start talking about our bodies in a good and healthy way. Yeah. Um, name body parts, talk about how God created us good and beautiful so that, because if you don't name body parts, that's what cultivates shame around the body parts because, oh, we can't even talk about that. If something's untalked about, <laughs> then it's like, oh, that's a bad thing. That's a nasty thing. And that's part of why I think kids do grow up with like body image issues and shame around their body. So you can begin there at two years old. I mean, you could begin as yeah. the young whenever as they you start are. asking questions. Yeah. Take them right, to a farm. Right. I don't think farm kids <laughs> ask a lot of questions about this. They see it all played out. This is <laughs> We went, we were on a, gosh, our kids were, I think maybe four to 10, four kids. And uh, we went some friends of ours and we went and saw the elephant seals on the beach. And it was, why are they on the beach? Well, it's mating season. Okay. These are elephant seals. And we're nice. like, what is that? What's going on? What's, what are they doing? What are they? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's have this conversation. <laughs> well, and yeah, if you all listen, go to birds and bees, we walk you through, they will equip you to have easy conversations and the phrase, I'm so glad you asked and this pleasant yes. look on your face. And I just felt so equipped. It's never been a shaming topic in our house. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Another piece of that too, I think, especially when it comes to the, the trans aspect mm. of this conversation is, is making sure that your kid doesn't feel confined to like certain stereotypes. You know, you can be a girl and love sports, wear short hair, want to play around, wrestle with the boys as a girl, as a, like that was a, a beautiful female at, Activity. So if you don't yeah. feel very feminine as a girl, that's 100% fine. You know who else didn't feel very feminine? Loads of godly women in the Bible. Same thing with boys. Like if a boy, you know, maybe is a little more sensitive or, you know, isn't into sports or all, you know, all these stupid stereotypes that our culture mm -hmm. builds around us. Yeah. I'm in Texas. So. Oh, okay. There, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm in Idaho, which is like Texas with mountains. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. I think at an early age, like saying it's okay to be yourself. You don't need to be confined to these narrow kind of stereotypes of what it means to be a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, you know? So um, I think that's really, you can establish that. They say kids start picking up on these stereotypes two years old, maybe three years old. Like they really start to have this real kind of real binary way of viewing. Here's how all men are supposed to be. Here's how all girls are supposed to be. And in our culture today, yeah, we, we've kind of created a lot of these different identities. Now, if you don't fit these neural stereotypes, then maybe you're gender queer, gender fluid, non-binary, yeah. which I'm not saying 
these terms are, are you know, like I, every generation has different terms to kind of name an experience. So I, I don't, don't freak out over the terms, whatever, but like, I also want to help my kid. Like, don't, don't be put in somebody else's identity box. You know, you're a girl who likes soccer and it seems, you know, has a kind of a more an aggressive spirit then great. Use it for the Lord, you know, like be a girl who likes soccer. That's awesome. You know, like don't let somebody else tell you who you are because you fit into this little, you know, whatever. So I think establishing that at an early age that you don't need, you know, a certain term to kind of, um, to name your experience. You, you be you and love others, love God, have fun, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cause they're not going to hear that from, from school these days. So, so if they're at school and a friend, comes to school and says, um, I'd like for you to call me. And they changed their name and they come home and talk about it. What's a good response to hold the, the line, which I think a majority of my listeners want to do of compassion, grace, love, and truth. Yeah. Names and pronouns are, Mm -hmm. they're, they're tricky. I mean, these, especially a name, if somebody wants to be called a different name, it's like, in a sense, kind of who, who cares, you know, like, like just call, call them the name that they're asking you to call them. Yeah. And I know even a lot of really conservative people I know say, yeah, with, when it comes to names, you know, I have no problem. It's the people might get hung up on the pronoun thing, but um, yeah, I think um, encouraging your kids, you know, um, if someone wants to go by a different name than they were did last week, then you know what, you, you can respect that. It's not, that's their decision, not yours, you know, and we, and you can even maybe in that context say, you know, we, we're not going to do that. You know, we, we did give you a name that, that, you know, as parents, we have the right to do. And, but you could say, Hey, you know, other families don't really have that, that viewpoint. That's, that's, we want to love others in the midst of disagreement. So I think affirming, encouraging your kid to be gracious, to be able to navigate this really changing social environment while still affirming that we as a family do have other standards. And you know what? That doesn't mean we're better than other people. That doesn't mean people are, you know, that we look down upon other people who have different viewpoints. We love everyone. Jesus has love everyone. Um, but that doesn't mean we're going to f- do what everyone else is, is going to be doing. The pronouns get a little trickier too. I, I still, our kids are going to have, our, if you're raising your kids in the Lord, if they maintain some semblance of a Christian worldview, <laughs> that's going to invite probably some serious pressure, maybe even hostility, bullying. Like it's going to be hard for our kids to be, have the stigma of being a Christian in this environment. So I'm going to say, what hills are we going to die on? Like, so you know what the pronoun thing in as much as they can. And and as much as they, I wouldn't force them make sure you use everybody's pronoun that, you know, but like, I would say, yeah, it's fine. You can use their pronouns. You know, I'm not going to make that because if they refuse they're going to be, I mean, heavily ridiculed, which again, if, if they're living out the gospel and embracing Jesus and the ridicule for that, then that's part of the Christian way. But when it's kind of a more of a gray area, like lose, using somebody else's pronoun that might change next week, whatever. And half the time, the kid doesn't even really know why there's, you know, there might be in an environment where everybody's kind of doing that. It's like, I'm just not gonna make that a big deal, you yeah. know? Um, so I, would you have thoughts on that? I, I'm sure you've had to navigate this. with. Well, people. I'm just, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about a conversation I had with Rosaria Butterfield, who lived a lesbian lifestyle and then is now uh, mm-hmm. married and, and adopted a couple of kids, but she came on the show and I'm just thinking about how she was loved to the gospel mm. and how her pastor invited her in and had dinner with her. And I just think what you're saying is right. Like let's love people where they are instead of assuming, which I think sometimes the posture is in the church that everyone around us has to live to this code of ethics and moral standards that we feel compelled by the Holy spirit to live by Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not old Testament believers. We're new Testament believers. The keeping the law doesn't make us right with God. We are right with God. And then we keep the law. So thinking that others who haven't even, they may not read the Bible. They may not have professed faith, right? Trying to hold them to a standard like, you, you know, you don't change your pronouns based on, yeah. you know, a feeling or a right. gender struggle or whatever. I just feel like that's not loving them. Well, you're, right. you're basically hold like what you think is important. You're putting on someone else. Right. You know, I often tell people that's great. A great point. Um, you know, language is what I call shared social space. 
if I go up to my British friend and I want to play soccer, <laughs> I might have to use the term football because that's going to reflect. And don't say his... khaki pants to them. And don't say I forgot. I, you know, I'm not going to wear pants today because it's really hot out because pants means underwear. Underwear and, <laughs> and khaki means poopy. So you'd say poopy <laughs> pants, <laughs> underwear, like poopy, poopy underwear, like poopy underwear. Yeah. So and, and this is kind of a, you know, a similar but not, you know, a different kind of thing where you know okay we have our, our language re- represents our culture our worldview and yeah. somebody else is going to use language that might reflect their worldview so as christians i think it's okay to meet people where they're at and and hopefully everybody listening can agree with this no matter where they are on, on some of these questions like the question of using pronouns is not on the same moral level as yeah. somebody like engaging in you know, like a sexual relationship outside of marriage or, you know, a threesome or something like it's, you have clear scriptures on that. When it comes to pronouns, we're dealing with some modern language and cultural things. And yeah, I, I think pronouns should match your biological sex, not your internal sense of who you, you are. Your gender identity is, is what that means, but somebody else might not hold that view. So what am I going to do? Just like not talk to them. I mean, yeah. Or, or just like, all right, I'll, I'll give, I'll, I'll give in this area. And, and there's other areas on where, where language where I'm, where I'm actually not, maybe n- won't give in. Um, okay. One of the ones that I, like an example I use is like, that, that I, I really, it kind of bothers me the, the phrase um, sex assigned at birth. Okay. Yes. Cause I said that, I said that earlier. Yeah, tell oh, me. Okay. No, no, tell well, me. I, you, dude, you didn't say that phrase. When I was talking Did about you? cisgender, maybe. Oh, I don't think he's used okay. so sex assigned at birth. Sex reflects assigned the, at birth. Okay. Like not gender, sex. Sex assigned at birth. Okay. Ge- so even um <laughs> I get a, everything we can get lost in the weeds here. So I, if just briefly, um in in this conversation, the term sex and gender are, are often used differently. Sex mm-hmm. refers to your biological, factual state, whether you're male or female. Mm-hmm. Gender can refer to kind of the social, psychological aspects of being male or female. So for instance, if I said, is pink male or female? And the answer is like, well, it's not, not, it's not male or female, but it is feminine. It is associated with femaleness given our culture, at least today. I mean, a hundred years ago, it was actually the opposite. Blue was considered feminine and pink was masculine. So the color pink is more in the realm of like gender, like expectations that we put on people if they're male or female. So all that to say, you know, the doctor assigned me male at birth. It's like, well, the doctor didn't make that decision. That was something is if you're a Christian, if you're religious, you know, God did that. If you're not, if you're an atheist, you'd say that's just part of being human. Like you're either male or female or your genetics. By, your, your genetics. genetics. Yeah. It happened in conception. The X Nobody and decided the Y that, that decided. Right, that. Yeah. right. Right. So, so all some that that very phrase sex assigned at birth it does reflect a certain ideology that i'm just like i just don't even agree with that somebody asks you hey so what sex were you assigned at birth i'm gonna say well god created me male um and that happened in conception (laughs) you know like i want want to use language that reflects my worldview i will concede if you you call me whatever you want to go by a different pronoun i will totally honor that but i'm not also not going to be forced into using language that reflects a an ideology or worldview that i don't even agree with you know so it's a, you see that it's, it's hard tension. Some people might say, yeah, that's why I don't use pronoun. So everybody has to kind of draw the line where they feel comfortable drawing it. I mean, yeah. and, and a lot of this is in a category of a gray area. So. Do you know what I don't want to spend time doing during the summer is coming up with meal plans or spending a lot of time grocery shopping or preparing food? And that's why I love telling you about HelloFresh in the summertime because you are going to get fresh quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week from signing up. You can get all those summer flavors right in your home, eating healthy. There's 30 dinner recipes to choose from every single week. And if you're going away for the summer, if you're going to have a vacation plan, you just click and you can change your schedule. It is foolproof in their recipes There's new menu releases all the time, and it's 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant. I don't know if that happens to you in the summer. You end up like you're out, you're at someone's pool, and it's like already 6.30 or 70 because it's so light outside, and you're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to have for dinner? Let's just go meet at a restaurant. Well, 
when you have HelloFresh in your fridge, you can just come home and put it all together, dinner on the table, you know it's good, you know it's healthy. So go to HelloFresh.com slash DMA for Don't Mom Alone, 1616. Use that code DMA16. You're going to get up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash DMA16. Use the code DMA16. You're going to get 16 free meals and three free gifts. You're going to find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. I'm a big fan of each person owning their own uniqueness, your own giftings, your own wiring. I am so proudly a crochet master and also a musical fan. And that individuality and me just even embracing some of my favorite color combinations and style has been so helpful in me just having a little more confidence and moving forward with who I am. And I love celebrating that through one of our sponsors, Pair Eyewear. What's really fun is you get to choose your base frame just like you would at any eyewear place, but then you get to change up your look. They have these top frames that mag- go on magnetically, and so you can change out your style depending on your mood for the day. I have a turquoise top that I can fit on to the, like the turtle shell base frame, and it just adds a little pop. You can change up your look so quickly. The base frame started just $60, including the prescription lenses. There's hundreds and hundreds of top frames. I'm telling y'all, there's sports teams, there's Marvel, whatever. You can look through so many different fun patterns. Change them up when you change your clothes. It's so fun. And for every pair purchase, Pair provides glasses and vision care for children around the world. Get glasses as unique as you are, one pair, Infinite style starting at just $60. Go to PearEyewear.com forward slash DMA for 15% off your first purchase. That's 15% off at P-A-I-R eyewear.com slash DMA. When I think a lot of these questions I got were, how do we basically hold on as a family? to our values in a world that doesn't align. And I think what you're saying is be clear. This is going to (laughs) happen. This happened what in the eighties about other things. Like you weren't allowed to listen to certain rock bands (laughs) because it didn't align with our family (laughs) value. You weren't allowed to whatever, like every family at some point has things they do and they don't do. I'm guessing now, maybe that's not true with younger families, but you're always mad at your parents because they won't let you do something that your friends it's like the classic cliche of, you know, if your friends went off the mountain, would you go off the mountain? I mean, <laughs> you're always trying to convince your parents to do something and there's going to be difference outside your home. I think what becomes really challenging and some of the questions I got was this family aspect. So aunt is now wanting to be called uncle. Okay. How do we navigate family gatherings to love our family member? Well, and so Again, I, it, it's probably all the things we've said before, but do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Well, and just so people know where I'm coming from, and I hold you know very firmly um, to a traditional sexual ethic, the marriage is between a man and a woman. Um, and I'm assuming maybe, I don't, I don't know your audit, but 30% might totally not agree with that. That's totally fine. I've got friends on both sides, but that's where I'm coming from. Um, I also know the really terrible reputation that Christians who have, also hold that view have built for the church for not just holding to a traditional sexual ethic, but actually demeaning, shaming, speaking negatively about LGBTQ people. And so we have this long history built up for ourselves that, that Christians who hold to a traditional sexual ethic don't like gay people. We're scared mm-hmm. of gay people. We're homophobic. So that's the reputation that I really am going to work hard to deconstruct. So that's why in this kind of grace truth tension, I do tend to emphasize a lot of grace, not because I think it's less or more important than the truth side of this, um, but because being gracious is part of the truth that I'm called to embody. And I'm up against a massive like cultural assumption that people have towards Christians, you know, it's, it'd be like, it'd be like, um, you know, this is a 
an extreme analogy, but sometimes you need extreme analogies <laughs> to make the point. You know, if you were a German missionary to Israel in Israel in 1951, <laughs> in the wake of the Holocaust, right? You would do well to keep that extremely dark history at the forefront of all your conversations with the with Jewish people and really work hard to deconstruct the assumption that if you're German, that means you want to kill all Jewish people, yeah. you know, like you would have to work hard to deconstruct that yeah. and, and find opportunities to do that. Well, on a lesser scale, but Christians is through the eighties, the AIDS ec- epidemic where we are celebrating God's punishment judgment towards gay people. And we were voting for people that were not helping gay people. And, and so you have a lot, like I have friends who, who grew up in that era and they're, they sat there holding their best friend while he died in the hospital of AIDS, while Christians were ranting and raving. And that's part of a narrative that, that has really angered a lot of LGBT people. And I, I really want to go out of my way to say, that's not me. I, yeah. I would not be celebrating the death of your friend. Um, so what was your question? <laughs> so I, well, I, I think all, all I agree with all that. I just marked like, start with this. <laughs> like I was like, whatever he just said, I want to start the episode with this because yeah, we are not an isolated generation right. and we've been past a faith that is very mixed in with some things that I think everyone's like, Oh, don't deconstruct. Well, I'm not decon, whatever that word means. I am like trying to hold on to the Jesus I know, the one I love, the Holy Spirit empowering me to keep a faith that's not something I do in my own power, and then also love other people around me well. And that does require, like you said, to be even more (laughs) adamant to love. And so if a friend of mine is walking through a challenge with their child and their child has told them information about their gender sexuality. I'm super thankful that my friend saw me as a safe person to talk about that. And that my language in general at all times, whether I'm with someone who's struggling or not, my language at all times is kind and loving and a posture of just generosity towards all people, Mm. not isolating any groups as, oh man, did you hear about so-and-so, you know, like, I just think we carry postures and our hearts actually are revealed in how we interact. And so um, as a mom community, and if those statistics are true, which I think they are, it's one in five, one in four kids. Mm -hmm. So either your child, you're listening, your child, and maybe some of what we said already is hurtful, harmful. I hope not. Or your friend right next to you or your other, you know, like your little group, your little mom's night out. And so to have that compassionate stance, even in just our conversation amongst moms, she might be holding on to something really hard right now. I mean, she doesn't, and her her child may be in a really hard place because although there is a belonging and a team, when you maybe identify as transgender, Mm -hmm. it's also not a easy path for anyone. And if you, if you're a parent, (laughs) And you look, you're looking for somebody to talk to. You want to talk to somebody that at all costs is going to love your, is going to love your kid. Yeah. It's so easy to send kind of us versus them signals yep. or kind of like, it doesn't take much to give the impression that like, oh, I, I'm not confident this person would actually love my kid. They may give me some Bible verses. They may tell me maybe true things that I might even agree with, but I'm not confident that if my kid showed up and identified as non-binary, a short blue hair or whatever, and that my, that, that, that this other person here is going to step down and take an interest in my kid. Cause at the end of the day, I love, love my kid. I just need help navigating this experience with them. And I only want people around me that I know are going to love my kid. Well, so we need to talk in very gracious ways, very loving ways, very interested ways in LGBTQ people, you know? Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, like you said, I mean, it's, I, I just, there's so many parents that have LGBT kids in, in, um, in the United Kingdom. Here's another stat. There's been a two to 5,000% increase among teenagers going to gender clinics because they're wrestling with their biological sex on some level in the, in the last 10 years, two to and five, the 5,000 is females. This is why 
anybody listening, if they're like, oh yeah, it seems like our youth group, our kids, our friendship group, I'm just going to, I'm going to assume that the majority of people identifying are teenage females, which is interesting because clinically diagnosed gender dysphoria, which is the the clinical diagnosis. Like when it's an actual, like a psychological psychological condition. Yes. Yeah. Neurological. Yes. I think that's yes. the new thing is to talk about our neurology. Okay. Yeah. Mental health. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was um, about point, according to the DSM, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 0.014% of the population were, was kind of diagnosed with gender dysphoria. It's very rare. Yeah. Primarily among males. So it's a rare psychological condition and it's mainly among males. So now when they're skyrocketing, hockey stick kind of spikes among younger people, primarily females now, th- this is an area where many um, very liberal, like not religious psychologists are like, this isn't, there's something going on like this. We have to ask like, other questions here because yeah. that's not statistically possible that, that all of a sudden you see skyrocketing numbers in a condition that's actually really w- rare among, among males. But um, yeah. Confused yet? <laughs> no, I mean, and that's, yeah, Rosaria talked about that. And it took me off guard because at the time, this was three years ago, she was bringing it up and the irreversible damage book. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you just freaked out all <laughs> the moms who are listening who thought we were going to talk about homosexuality or, or um, gay lesbian yeah. issues. And now yeah. we're talking about hysterectomies and mastectomies yeah. in girls. And she was right. I mean, she was right. That was the next thing. Um, It's one of the most frightening aspects of this conversation because it's one thing for a kid to explore their sexuality, maybe engage in certain behaviors. I'm not going to, I don't want to minimize that, that 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 can have a lasting effect, but certainly not as much as a girl who I will use the term might be confused. They're in an environment doing this, identifying as that, exploring this friendship group and to get, an irreversible surgery or even taking testosterone for a couple of years can cause your uterus to atrophy. You're typically going to be permanently infertile, which every 16 year old girl is going to say, well, I don't have kids anyway. Well, yeah. will you say that at 26 or 36? Like you don't know yeah. to make that lifelong decision as a teenager is just, but a percentage of the medical field is almost encouraging this. Um, there's a growing number of outliers who are now speaking. In fact, there was some, um, yeah, definitely a growing number of like high up people saying, hey, I think we're maybe <laughs> it's a little skewed bit a little. I this, mean, the so. fact that like Bill Maher, again, we'll show, yeah. we'll put the clip, <laughs> but he's like red flag. Yeah. This is beyond, you know, I'm thankful that people can come out and they can share and eat these challenges and they're legitimate. But we have gone beyond legitimate to um, mm-hmm. kind of a catastrophic number. And to me, it, it's. Um, you know, I think of, of parents who are in this conversation and it's beyond, you know, this is what our family believes. And so I want you to go love people outside. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. your child's coming to you yeah, and they're saying, I think I am a boy. I think I am a girl. How do they answer them yeah. and still staying in loving relationship and hold to yeah, those beliefs? So that's a really tough one, especially since you're up against a social environment, whether it's an online environment, school environment, where they're going to be probably dealing with a lot of other heavy influences. Um, The number one thing I tell parents all the time, all the time is be a curious, compassionate listener. As much as your kid might say something that's like kind of, you, you want to freak out, maybe you're kind of upset or like scared or like what's going on. Like, Try hard not to do that, especially in front of your kid. Don't freak out in front of them and just take a gen, be genuinely curious about the identity they're using, the questions they're asking. I love what you said. You know, that's really great with a smile. That's a wonderful I'm question. I'm so glad you asked. So glad you asked that. It's <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel so like you I've practiced, practiced that. Oh, I have four <laughs> I boys. Sparkle on I don't know here. if you know. I have four boys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I've practiced oh, yeah. that a lot. I've even got the point. I can talk about masturbation with my boys. So like, I feel like I'm winning go. in this yeah, whole thing if I can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, good, and not, good. and not in an awkward way, y'all, this is possible. Okay. So keep going. Yes. Yes. So, so glad uh, being, you asked being, being compassionate and curious. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Listening, listening, listening. And because the, the, the one of the ultimate relational goals is that you would establish a thick layer of relational trust so that if and when you get to a place to when you can maybe speak some more truth or rationality or just good science, you know, into the lives of your kid, that will be received well. It will not be received well if you're if they don't trust you or they don't think you're listening or or they think you're just kind of t- speaking stuff at them and don't really care about their well-being. I mean, all this is parenting 101, but sometimes when it comes to sexuality and gender conversation, we freak out and just want to pound them with the well, Bible or something. And I'm just anything. telling you, it's very isolating. It's yeah. not like, hey, I have a two-year-old and I want to potty train them. And you talk to 10 friends and get advice. Hmm. This is, I'm going through this in my house and it's causing some mental health. And this is like getting, this is escalating. Mm -hmm. Like I can't shut it down and say, Nope, that's not true because then that leads to suicidal thoughts. I mean, this is like a massive struggle for a parent and they can't go to other people. Right. And so, I mean, you have a great course (laughs) for parenting (laughs) LGBTQ, which helps provide, is there a communal aspect to that or are parents just consuming it? On their own, um, we have uh, study guides for group discussion. So if people want do you want to go into a group? What we haven't formulated yet, we've talked about it, is kind of establishing sort of online groups that people can kind of jump into. Because um, I feel like there would be a, you're not in my town, you don't know my friends, right. but I need people to talk to. Yeah. Um, Everywhere I go. So I was just um, last week. I was speaking at four different churches in four different states in five days. It was insane. But most of them were talks to parents. Yeah. I mean, hundreds, thousands of parents showing up because they're all in this together. And they, they don't, re- they don't know that they're like, I thought it was only one. They show up and yeah. there's like, there's like 1400 parents, you know, the same. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing to know. If you're a parent, you are hundred percent not alone. They might feel like you are, yeah. um, but there's so many parents out there, Christian parents wrestling with the exact same questions you are. So yeah, it would be good to kind of cultivate some sort of connection with other parents. I mean, if you're in a church of more than a hundred, there's going to be at least Half a dozen. What do they say? 20, least, 22, I mean. 22 of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No, I, yeah. uh, I'm just thinking about too, like, like you said, it goes beyond I, I'm a boy and I'm attracted to other boys or I'm a girl. And I'm attracted to other boys or other girls. So they're coming to you and they're thinking, I want to start testosterone or I want to, you know, mm-hmm. take hormones. I want to get surgery. Mm-hmm. Is it reasonable? Like in your conversations with friends, is it, how do you think they would have received a parent setting a boundary of, I totally hear you. I hear that that's, you know, I'm listening. We're going to hold off on surgery until um, you're 18, 21. Like what's a reasonable. Yeah. I mean, is there's no legal, right? There's no. The, with, con- um, no, there, there's restrictions. It goes state by state. Okay. Um, oh, some of the, the scary thing. ones like Oregon, last time I checked, the age of consent was like 15. So you can go in and get a double mastectomy at 15 without your parents even knowing that that's, that's really, I think most States are, I want to say 18, um, okay. but, but some they're trying to get that age lower. So let me say this. If I was a Bible hating atheist, yeah. <laughs> hated, you know, the picketed whole every Sunday. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I would be 100% against teens transitioning. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> you know, who else agrees with me on that? Every single older trans person I've ever talked to. <laughs> That's what I'm curious about. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Tell me about when you've talked to them. Older trans, there, there's within the, even the trans conversation, there's, there's a unspoken kind of tension chasm between older trans people or especially older, older gay and lesbian people that they're, mm-hmm. they're probably the most concerned because they see a lot of these younger trans identified, non-binary identified kids is basically well, you're, you're gay, but if you transition, it's almost like a homophobic, like you're going to transition your gayness away. So you're turning all these gay men into, or turning all these really lesbian girls into straight men. And so they see it as kind of a backlash, um, mm. kind of a resurrection of kind of a, a new homophobia. There's several like Andrew Sullivan and other 
outspoken Barry Weiss and gay non-religious journalists are very concerned about what's going on among younger kids. So, yeah, I mean, even my older trans friends, you know, they're like, look, gender, dysfo- actual diagnosable gender dysphoria. They're, they'd be like, I had this since I was three years old. It was debilitating. It was crippling. I tried everything to, I had mental health issues that I tried to take care of. Um, I waited until I was later in life. I could make an actual irreversible decision. And I knew what I was doing. And for me, it was like a last ditch effort to survive. It wasn't in in their terms, they would say it wasn't trendy to be, you know, trans. And even then, like, if you're not dealing with all your mental health issues and you think that transition is going to solve that, you got another thing coming to you. You're just going to be adding more difficulty to your life. So they would just say, say that, you know, teenagers don't have the ability to make these lifelong irreversible decisions, especially yeah. if, if <laughs> there's a slight chance that society, their social environment is playing some role here. Yeah. If that's even a possibility, then let's yeah. wait, let's move on. Let's get to college. Let's get you out of that social environment. And if you still have utterly debilitating, can't leave my house, gender dysphoria, and you're 23, 24, 24, your brain's fully developed, you know, people then are like, okay. Have a then, conversation. Then, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, if, as a parent, I would in, in, with a lot of grace and understanding, I would really hold a line saying, as long as you're under my authority, we are not taking cross-sex hormones or getting a surgery. And, and maybe, maybe a, a new name, maybe um, social transitioning, haircuts, clothing, maybe that can be a media, medium. Yeah. Like make allowances for, oh, you want to dress differently than the other boys or the other girls. Sure. Great. I mean, that's, Right. That's like yeah. par for teenager life, like trying to find right. your identity on that, on those externals. But right. yeah, right. maybe not change yeah. anything internal just yet permanently. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. That's where I would be. And again, I say that not as a Christian, but just as a parent, you know, um, yeah. who, who's seen kind of the wider conversation and, and seen how much damage there has been done to young, especially women. Yeah. You had a guest on, I think, a gal, right? Who, had taken the hormones, had double mastectomy. She's married now and had a baby. Yeah. I've had was a few on. Daisy. I think Daisy uh, was Daisy, the one I saw. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Daisy was on, uh, Heather, um, not Heather. You're Heather. That's me. Um, <laughs> Helena, Helena. Kirchner That's not my story. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Helena. Okay. Yeah. And y'all, yeah. we can't cover all of this in our little short time. <laughs> if you weren't aware that's I connect you with people and resources. So, you know, that you don't mom alone. Remember that's my tagline. And so I'm connecting you with Preston because he goes deep on a lot of these topics and has a variety of guests that you're going to want to hear from. And then they do have that resource, the parenting LGBTQ uh, kids. And so Mm -hmm. I just want to offer those options to you because this is, this is, we're not saying this is easy. It's not, it's not easy but we want to side with love and grace. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Preston, for being with me. Sure. Really yeah, appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. You. Thanks y'all for joining me today. I hope you do stay connected with Preston. And if you are needing that course for parents, please check that out in the show notes um, and lots of other episodes. Definitely check out all my episodes with Mary Flo and Megan from Birds and Bees. If you are have never talked to your kids about body, um, theology of the body, or even just sex, there's just such great resources from Birds and Bees. It is going to equip you. Also, my interviews with Jackie Hill Perry and Rosaria Butterfield are fantastic. So check those out. I'm going to pray over us as we navigate these things this summer and as we head into next school year. Lord, I thank you that you have given us children to steward. I thank you for this next generation that's coming up. And I pray, Lord, that moms of young children would not walk forward in fear um, of unknown things, unknown to them in their generation. But I pray, Lord, that they would feel equipped and inspired that they get to develop these trusting and connected relationships with their kids, relationships that aren't built out of fear, but out of love, and that they get to communicate 
who you are to their kids and that they can trust that nothing can sabotage your love for them. I thank you that you aren't surprised by any of what's going on in our culture. And I pray, Lord, that we can be friends and neighbors and family members to the world that they would know you better, that nothing would come between your love being expressed through us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us know how to use language that doesn't cause further division, but that we could be that light that shines and that we could be hope bringers and that we can um, be good moms to other moms who are having a really hard time, that we can be a safe place for them to come to us and talk about uh, what they're walking through with their child without judgment and without advice. And Lord, I pray for Preston as he continues to navigate being this bridge and walking uh, and talking and learning. And I pray, Lord, that we would be compassionate and curious listeners to our kids. And Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, y'all, for joining me. I will see you back here next week. And starting in a couple weeks is our summer of mentorship. You don't have to do a single thing. You could gather friends if you want to. You don't have to. We're just going to bring back some past guests. I've recorded some new interviews with them. We'll have discussion questions like we always do, and we will put them in the show notes for this summer of mentorship. And yeah, you can just gather people and talk about it this summer, uh, six weeks of interviews. So that starts in a couple weeks. If you want to make a plan with your friends to get together, if you want even more support, you could join our Podcast Club Leaders Facebook group and just go to don'tmomalone.com and you can find a Podcast Club button there to put in your email and get connected that way. Um, But otherwise, I'll see you back here next week. Adios. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Don't Mom Alone podcast. If you're wanting to connect with more people and more resources to help remind you that you're not alone, head over to don'tmomalone.com. That's where you'll also find show notes with any links mentioned by our guests. Most importantly, I want you to know the good news. The great news that you're not alone because God has promised to always be with you. With faith in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, Jesus said when he left, he was going to leave a helper, a comforter to be with us. God in us. Moms, that's superpower. So while you're washing dishes at your kitchen sink, while you're driving to and from work, while you're feeding that baby late into the night, while you're cleaning sticky floors, God promises to be just as present with you as when you're worshiping in a church pew. As it says in Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now that's good news. Have a great day.